Let's kick it. Hey, this is Melody Warnick. I'm the author of This Is Where You Belong, The Art and Science of Loving the Place You Live. And I'm here today kicking it with Dari. Hello, and welcome to the Kicking It With Dari Show. This is your host, Dari Allen Nieves. And today, my guest is none other than best-selling author, Melody Warnick. Melody Warnick is the author of This Is Where You Belong, The Art and Science of Loving the Place You Live, which is a study and story-rich exploration of the groundbreaking concept of place attachment. This book helps movers and stayers alike rethink the value of their community. A freelance journalist for more than a decade, Warnick has written for The Guardian, Atlantic City Lab, Quartz, Reader's Digest, O, The Oprah Magazine, Red Book, Better Homes and Gardens, and many other publications. She and her book have also been featured in the likes of Time, Fast Company, Psychology Today, Realtor.com, Forbes.com, and Inc.com. A chronic mover, Melody managed to fall madly in love with her adopted town of Blacksburg, Virginia, where she lives with her husband and two daughters. Find out more at her website, MelodyWarnick.com, or follow her on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook at Melody Warnick. So now I would like to welcome to the show, Mrs. Melody Warnick. Welcome to the show, Melody. Thanks so much for having me, Dari. This is so exciting. You know, we don't know each other. I was like fanning out over your book because I actually saved something. I don't know what I was doing. Maybe it was an Amazon preview thing. Like, if you like this, you'll like that. And I had it saved. Like, I saved the Amazon page in my Evernote as one of my many, many I would like dream to have this person on the show type file. And I looked back maybe a couple months ago and I was like, this book came out last summer and I haven't even like attempted to talk to this person. So it's good. It worked out. I know you've been sick lately. You're here now. We're good. And I'm excited to talk about moving and trying to find the place where you belong. I have suffered with this thought of going somewhere and feeling like, this is my place. This is where I belong. It's something that we'll talk about shortly. I think that's called the geographic cure. But, you know, like many millions of Americans, Melody, I am a fairly mobile adult. I've been moving a lot ever since I left college. And I've always been looking for that place that I belong. So this book is right up my alley. I think I've moved about 10 times in the past 18 years, if I, unless I lost count. And it was always by choice. It wasn't my job that made me move. It wasn't the military or anything. Um, My most recent move was about 10 months ago, and it was less than two hours away. And I still miss that old city a little bit. I don't miss the traffic there. It was a major metropolitan city. I don't miss the traffic, but I miss a lot of other stuff. I miss the food. I miss being near my friends and stuff. And even though I can see some of the benefits of moving to where I am right now, I would be lying if I said that I was in love with it. And I really can't say that there's any city that I've lived in that really feels like home, not even the place where I grew up for 20 years. Like nothing seems to feel like home. So I'm really glad that I found your book because you've done a lot of studies and a lot of uh, psychology behind it to explain why we move so much and lots of comparisons in different places in America. You start off in that book, This Is Where You Belong, by talking about place attachment and this belief that me and thousands and millions of others have that you call the geographic cure. So I'd first like to start why you wrote the book and and where it came from, and then we'll go into the geographic cure after that. Yeah, absolutely. So I was kind of like you, like grew up in one town in Southern California, never moved for 18 years, you know, lived on the same cul-de-sac. And then I went away out of state to college and I got married at the end of college and my husband got a job on the other side of the country. So we moved from Utah to Maryland for work. And then after we'd been there a few years, we weren't really loving it. So we moved back to the West to be closer to home. And then we moved again, this time to Iowa. So my husband could go to grad school. It was kind of on and on like that. We just moved every few years. And you mentioned that you moved by choice, not necessarily because of a job or something. You just decided, I'm going to go give that town a try. So I always say that, you know, we moved for good reasons, you know, jobs and grad school and family, um, things like that. 
But there always was this element of we're going to find a better town to live in. Um, that is the idea of the geographic cure that you kind of create this idea in your mind that if you can just get to the right place, that everything will click for you. You know, the next town is going to be so much better than your current town. It will solve all these problems. There won't be traffic or it won't be so hot or whatever it may be. Um, and I found that with myself, every time I moved, I always did that, you know, had this magical thinking about what the next town was going to do for my life. I was going to be a better person in the next town and I was going to be happier and I'd be a better neighbor and a better mom and a better writer and all these things. Um, and I'd get to the next town and realize that like every place on earth, it has its own issues and the place did not in fact, cure me of everything that was wrong with me. And I'd start thinking, well, you know, maybe it's time to move on to the next place. So this sort of became a habit of mind that we'd live in a place for a few years, tire of it, find things wrong with it, and decide that we were <laughs> going to, you know, reset and get a blank slate in someplace else entirely. So my very last move, um, we were living in Austin, Texas, which is a place that when you tell people you are, you know, living in Austin, they go, oh my gosh, I've heard Austin is such a cool town. And it really was in a lot of ways. But again, there were ways in which it was not perfect. Surprise, surprise. It was really hot. And my husband had a fairly long commute to work and we had to drive on the freeway all the time. And my kids didn't like that. And so a job opportunity came up for my husband in a small college town in Virginia called Blacksburg. It's where Virginia Tech is. And again, despite years of experience, that magical thinking kicked in, the geographic cure, this idea that we're going to move to this new town and it's going to be Mayberry and we're going to know <laughs> everyone and we're going to just like sit on the front porch with our lemonade. Um, and, and so we moved, you know, with these really high hopes that Blacksburg was going to make everything about our lives better. And we got here in, in 2012 and pretty quickly realized that all my ideas about how Blacksburg was going to improve my life were not true. <laughs> you know, like these, uh, the bottom line is moving is always a little crappy. Um, it can be really lonely, especially if you're moving cross country to a place where you don't know anyone. Um, and so we got here and I didn't know anyone and I had never lived in this part of the South before, you know, I'd go to the hardware store and be like, I don't understand you because your accent is so thick. And, you know, like I felt very much like I was in a foreign country and it was a weird feeling. And so I started to think, well, we gave Blacksburg a shot, you know, a good two months, and now it's time to think about the next place. I'll get back on realtor.com and find someplace new to live. Uh, but I kind of caught myself this time. I caught myself creating this fantasy in my mind that the new place would somehow be better. It would fix everything. And I realized that it might be a little bit more up to me to decide that a place was right, that there was not a perfect city out there that I just hadn't discovered, but that a lot of how happy we feel in our places, how rooted we feel, depends on our behaviors in that place and our patterns of thought. So I started working on the book because of that, because I wanted to feel more at home in my community in, in Virginia. And I wanted to create a roadmap for other people to do the same. I, you know, I knew a lot of people like you, Duri, who move a lot and don't feel particularly rooted and struggle with it. And I wanted, um, I wanted to know if there was a way that people who, who are new to a community or people who have been there a long time can feel better about their town. So that was kind of the impetus for writing This Is Where You Belong. I just love that title. It was like, Dere come to me when I saw the title of the book. <laughs> like that's, I'm like, yes, I am going to study this thing. 
First thing I want to mention real quick is something you mentioned about, um, you know, people thinking that, you know, they're going to go someplace and feel happy, or maybe they're rooted and they feel happy. And there's something that came to mind that a, a previous guest of mine mentioned, which is that happiness is really a choice. It's not dependent on the circumstances around you. Like you have to make up your mind that you're going to be happy today where you are, like physically where you are in the, your town and like in a not so physical sense of where you are. And you also talked about being rooted. And so I'm thinking that there's a relationship with those concepts that, you know, there's differences between being mobile, being stuck or feeling stuck and being rooted. I want to hear what you have to say about this, but I'm thinking that there's a connection with that feeling in your mind about whether you're happy and satisfied someplace, whether you feel like you are rooted or stuck or mobile. Yeah, absolutely. So the idea of mobile, rooted, or stuck actually comes from the sociologist Richard Florida. And he says that you know, we can divide Americans into these three categories. So mobile people are people like you've been who just move a lot. You know, they're kind of looking for the next best. Um, the next place to to live or, you know, for jobs or whatever reason, they're moving a lot and they're not really settled in any one place. Then you have people who are stuck. Um, and those are people who live in a place, maybe they've been there a long time, but they just feel kind of trapped by it. They feel like, you know, I don't want to be here, but I don't have a choice about it. I'm stuck. So rooted people are people who feel happy. You know, they want to be where they are. And it's kind of irregardless of how long they've been there. So you can live in a place for 20 or 30 years and feel rooted, or you can feel rooted after living in a place for a year or two. It really is, like you said, Dari, more about your attitude toward it, your feeling of satisfaction there, your feeling of happiness, or um, your feeling of, I chose this. You know, this is This is what I want for myself. You know, that concept of being rooted was a big thing that I dug up in my research. So, you know, I've been a writer for most of my career. I spent many years writing for magazines. And so my first line of defense when I'm, you know, in a situation where I'm not particularly happy as I was in those early days right after moving to Virginia is to turn to research and see what the research has to say about fixing this problem. And so the thing that came up that surprised me was this concept of place attachment. Um, And place attachment is the, it's the fancy word for being rooted. It's this idea of the emotional bond you have with the place you live. And it's something that scientists and psychologists and sociologists actually study, um, that this can affect how happy we are and how healthy we are. It affects our levels of well-being. So people who are place attached, which I kind of describe as having that, you know, Dorothy Gale, no place like home feeling, are also people who tend to have more social capital where they live, meaning they have more friends and relationships. They tend to volunteer more. They're more involved in their communities. Um, and they also have higher levels of happiness and well-being. Uh, they're less likely to be ill, to have heart attacks and strokes. One study I found showed that it studied elderly women in Japan and found that women who liked where they lived and also knew and liked their neighbors were 6% less likely to die <laughs> um, than similar people who didn't like where they lived. So it's sort of this touchy feely concept, you know, like whether you like your community or not, but it actually has some really proven physical and emotional benefits. Yeah, I agree. I understand about what you say about that whole social thing, because a lot of people that are rooted or that stay somewhere for a long time, a lot of it is because they have a lot of support they have a lot of connections, they have a lot of friends, they have family there. And that's one of the first things that people would ask me whenever I would move somewhere, they would be like, oh, okay, what brings you to such and such? You have family here? And I would always be like, no. (laughs) And they're all like, oh, okay, well, it's because of your job, right? And I'm like, no. 
And it's like all the typical reasons why you might think somebody would move somewhere, you know, trying to find that common bond when you're making small talk. <laughs> I didn't have them like, oh, no, th- I just, you know, I've seen Atlanta on a lot of TV shows. I think I wanted to move down here. It looked like fun. You know what I mean? It's not like the typical response. It's probably half true, but, you know, um, there's different things that draw someone to a city. And um, I like when you're talking about social things, I like a point that you made. You haven't talked about it yet. We'll talk about it now about being neighborly and the fact that almost a third of us as Americans don't know our neighbors by even their first name. I wonder why are we less neighborly than we used to be? Why are we hesitant to, you know, bring that cake over next door? I think there's a lot of reasons. I think, you know, a big obvious one is we're busier. We work longer hours and, um, you know, there are more to working parent homes and people feel really stressed for time. And so when they have free time, you know, we tend to hunker down a little more in our houses. You know, it used to be that people socialized with their neighbors. Like you would get together with your neighbors and like do bunko night once a week or poker or something like that back in the 50s and 60s. And now that's really unusual, which I think also relates to the fact that we are more interested in hanging out with people that we have a lot in common with beyond proximity, you know, beyond we chose to live in the same place. So, and we have more mechanisms to find those people through online meetups and and things like that, Facebook groups. And so we're a little less interested, I think, in just, you know, hanging out with the people next door because they happen to live next door. But there are some amazing benefits to it. One study that um, I found that really stunned me at the time was from the University of Michigan that found that people who have high levels of trust with their neighbors, meaning you know they know their neighbors, they would give their neighbor the key to the house when they're going out of town, stuff like that, are 68% less likely to have a heart attack and 47% less likely to have a stroke. That has a really significant effect for something as simple and everyday as knowing your neighbors. So one of the things that I did in the book was set myself, I called them love where you live experiments. These were little behavior modification um, experiments that would get me to do things a little different in a way that was designed to improve place attachment. So I found so much research about the benefits of knowing your neighbors, how, like you said, having friends and social relationships where you live makes you feel more rooted. And so I decided I wanted to get to know my neighbors a little better. I'm traditionally a terrible neighbor, definitely one of those people who you know, I'll wave at you, I'll smile, I'll I'll be kind of vaguely nice, but I don't necessarily (laughs) want to like invite you in or chat every day. But, you know, and I live here in, in my town of Blacksburg. I live on a street where, you know, lots of rentals, people kind of coming and going. It feels a little transient. But for this Love Where You Live experiment, I made a huge batch of banana muffins and I started taking them around to my neighbors on Good Neighbor Day, which sounds like I made a holiday, but it's actually real. <laughs> it's in September. Um, and so I, my family went with me. We took these plates of banana muffins and said, you know, happy Good Neighbor Day. It was really the cheesiest thing you can <laughs> possibly imagine. And certainly if that feels awkward to you, you don't have to do anything like that. But what we found was it was a really good icebreaker. People were surprised and grateful. There's a guy who lived across the street from us who, you know, we kind of like waved at him, but didn't really talk to him. And he did not look like our family did. You know, I have these big ear gauges and dreadlocks and stuff like that. But we took him these banana muffins and I sort of thought, he's just gonna like laugh us out the door. But he was so happy. <laughs> like he really just fell over himself saying how great it was, how, you know, how thankful he was. And then we just stood there and like chatted for a little while. And he told us the story of the house we lived in and things that he knew that, that we didn't. Um, He turned out to be this great repository of information about our street. So things like that, these small gestures that we make to our neighbors 
make us feel more of a sense of community on our street and our block. And that's really important to our sense of security and well-being where we live. Later, we, we had neighbors who were Sri Lankan and we invited them over for dinner and it turned into this nice relationship, which is not to say that we ended up BFFs or we were hanging out all the time, but there was a sense of trust there. And in the scientific literature, trust is kind of the key word. You know your neighbors well enough to trust them that they would help you if, if you were in a bind, you know, that they might get your mail when you go out of town, stuff like that. And I found that by doing these small acts with the banana bread and inviting neighbors to dinner, later we had a, a little, you know, dessert potluck with some different neighbors. Those things um, made us feel a sense of connection to those people and helped us like and trust them, which was really helpful. Yeah, that's really something that's missing now. Um, and I know a lot of us are, are guilty of that. And I'm thinking back while you're talking and telling the story about the muffins and, and talking to people and getting reactions that you didn't think that you would get uh, just by looking at people. You know, I can relate to that. Up until a year ago, I was a single mom and I was a single mom for over a decade. And so when I moved certain places, there was a great concern about my neighbors. And the best experiences that I've had in places have been places where I had a good neighbor, like a good next door neighbor or somebody right down the hall that either they had a child or they were someone that I could trust. And, you know, they would come in my home or I would come in their home. We might watch TV together, things like that. So I completely can relate to that. And I haven't done it here yet, but for whatever reason, you know, I, I tend to default to that as well, where I'm like, you know what, I don't really want to be bothered. I'm going to wave at you and smile and stuff, but I'm not, you know, trying to, you know, right. spend a lot of time with you like that. I got things to do. Well, it's and and the thing is, like, it sounds like something really time consuming. And if you're, you know, if you feel like, well, I can't go talk to them until I can bring them homemade cookies or whatever, then it might be like that, but I've actually heard about some cool projects lately that make it a little easier. Like there's a, a woman in Texas named Kristen Shell who was planning a, a backyard barbecue and she ordered a picnic table to have some extra seating. And when the store delivered it, they dropped it in her front yard and she was kind of like, oh, like I kind of like it there, you know? Um, so she left it there. She painted it turquoise. And she kind of made an effort to go sit out there, like if she was just, you know, reading or, you know, her family would eat dinner at this picnic table in their front yard, whereas normally most of us do that kind of stuff in our backyard. And it made it so that her, if her neighbors were out walking their dogs or something, they would stop by and they would start to talk. Um, and it became a gathering place in the neighborhood. So I think even just little things like that, like moving some of the stuff you do inside or in the backyard to the front yard may kind of opens you up to meeting your neighbors and getting to them. Like it doesn't have to be this enormous, you know, epic. We're having everyone over for dinner or we're throwing a huge block party. It can be just like a simple effort that gets you into a place where you're more likely to meet a neighbor and talk to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I know a lot of people when they think about even though it's a neighbor, they might think, OK, that's strange and it's awkward. I've been living here for a while. What am I right. just going to, you know, but it could be something simple. I mean, I, there's times where, you know, it might be a circumstance where you got someone else's mail by mistake and, you know, you can chit chat for a hot second. But I want to move to another thing in the book. You've got this love your city checklist. And another thing that resonated with me here. One of the suggestions is to follow the one mile solution. And when I think about one of the most uh, enjoyable things about when I was living in Atlanta for six years, it was the years that I ran when I did races, when I ran by myself, when I ran with a group. And um, even if I would run in some of the same areas that I would drive every day, it's a completely different experience walking it, running it, or biking it than it is just driving down the road. You're not connected with what's around you. And so one of your suggestions is to replace a car trip, like one car trip per week, with a bike or walking errand instead. What is it about getting on foot that connects you to a place? Well, we hear a lot about that kind of suggestion, you know, replace some of your car trips with, you know, biking or walking trips as sort of an environmental thing, which it is. Um, but 
I love it because it really helps you experience a place in a different way. When you're in a car, you know, you have the windows rolled up and you're going really fast and you just sort of see the very surface level of where you are. When you're walking or running or on a bike, you're going at a much slower, I call it a human pace. You are in a position where you can notice things around you. You can kind of notice details of buildings that you're passing or your neighbor's yards. You're also, you know, and and this kind of relates to what we were talking about with neighbors, because you're outside, you're in a place where you are coming into contact with people potentially. And not like, you know, you pass someone walking or something and you stop and like, hey, Um, but you know, you say hi, and it makes you feel a little connected with other people. There's also this thing called mental maps. And when you're new to a place, that's one of the things you lose. When you live in a town for a long time, you have a real sense of the map of the place, how to get from point A to point B, what shortcuts will save you time or avoid the highway or the traffic or whatever. And as you move into a new community, all that stuff is lost. And that is one of the things that's hard about moving. It can make you feel really overwhelmed and like a stranger in your own town. Walking and biking, because they're slow um, and because they kind of put you more out into the community are a great way to figure out your way around, to explore a little bit and develop a sense of what this place is all about. I'm a walker, not a runner. I only run when people chase me, but (laughs) I I like to walk. um, And so I've, you know, developed this fairly regular habit of walking in the neighborhood near my house. And because I do that, you know, I know the names of certain dogs <laughs> on my walk, or, you know, I know that this car belongs to this house, or I've seen people, you know, I've had conversations with people that I've passed on the sidewalk. It becomes really familiar. And a lot of rootedness is simply about that sense of familiarity, that something is comfortable and um, you know it. And when you know things, you begin to feel almost a sense of ownership over them. Like, this is my town. You know, this is my neighborhood. This is my street Mm -hmm. because I walk it or I run it all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We used to always say that, like, you know, I run this town, you know, like there'd be shirts and stuff about it. Like, and that's how you feel, especially when you have achieved a particular milestone or discovered something special. You're like, you're not just exploring, like you feel like you own the place, like you own this, you run this. And it's a very empowering feeling. It's great. I mean, I'm sure the endorphins are off the chain when you feel like that, you know? (laughs) Exactly. Um, I want to finish with uh, one last question, Melody. You said that according to the Night Soul of Community Study, there's three factors that are most influential in creating place attachment, which are social offerings, aesthetics, and openness. Yeah. So the Night Soul of the Community Study was a huge study run by the Knight Foundation, which studies you know places and communities, and Gallup, which does like all the polling in the world. Um, and they started this back in 2009. They surveyed people in 26 different towns and cities across the country. And they were asking them questions about what made them love where they live, what made them happy there. So they would ask them questions about you know, what do you think of the police force and the local schools and city government and things like that? Um, And they would get these results in and they were surprised to find that year after year, you know, over the three years of the study in city after city, big cities and small towns all over the country, the same three factors rose to the top as um, the most important influence on whether people felt rooted and attached to their city. Um, And they were, like you said, social offerings, aesthetics, and openness. So to explain a little more, social offerings is kind of having stuff to do where you live and people to do it with, feeling like there's interesting things going on. Aesthetics is feeling like your town is pretty or good looking, clean, stuff like that. And openness is feeling like your town is friendly and welcoming and that it provides opportunities for 
all kinds of people. So it's sort of like um, if you were describing it as a person, you would say they're fun and good looking and friendly. <laughs> That's what we want in a town. And so when people describe their towns in that way, they, you know, they said there was things to do, it was beautiful, and it felt pretty welcoming to all kinds of people, then they had higher levels of place attachment, meaning they felt more rooted, they liked where they lived more, they were happier there. And there was a side benefit to that, that the higher the level of place attachment in the town, the better the town did economically. So as place attachment went up, so did local GDP which is kind of an astounding thing. It's like our towns can tell that we love them. Um, (laughs) The thing that really interests me about this is it kind of goes back to how you described your life, Jury, of making choices to move to cities just because, you know, hey, I saw it on TV. It looks like a cool place. Let's go there. And Actually, studies show that more and more people are doing that, especially millennials, that they're choosing where they want to live before they get a job. Um, You know, they decide, I want to go live in Raleigh or Chicago or whatever, and they move there and then they find the job. But they know that they want to be in this place. That's becoming more common. While I researched, this is where you belong, I talked to a lot of people who were making decisions like that. And sometimes people would travel around the country visiting different cities and sort of giving them a tryout before they decided where they wanted to live. I talked to one guy who made this massive spreadsheet of, you know, qualities that mattered to him in a city. Um, And they were things like, you know, it has a good local cinema and there aren't a lot of ticks and, and, you know, things that to him personally mattered. But I think when we ponder where we want to settle, we need to think about these three things, social offerings, aesthetics, and openness. If you go to a town and you feel like, wow, you know, there's a decent amount of stuff to do. It's pretty, you know, it appeals to my sense of aesthetics and people seem friendly and there are opportunities here for outsiders. That's a really good sign. And as I travel and speak to different audiences, I tell cities to focus on those things, you know, as city leaders are trying to figure out, you know, how do we make our towns better? How do we attract new residents? Those are kind of the three things that really matter and are fairly easy to change. So it's kind of nice. But one of the things that I, that really stunned me from the outcomes of the study is that it wasn't like it really mattered how beautiful a place was. You know, this, these are not objective measures. No one was going to these towns you know, with a a checklist counting up how many museums they had or how many beaches or whatever. It really was all just people's personal feelings. They polled the residents and asked them what they thought. And that tells me that place attachment really is a product of mind. (laughs) It's how you choose to see your city. You can choose to see the things that your city is terrible at, and every city is terrible at certain things. You can focus on the bad crime rate or, you know, the neighborhood with the houses that are falling down, or you can choose to focus on the things that your town is doing right. And you can become part of that. You can become engaged in your community. You can volunteer. You can sign up for a city board. In the book, you mentioned the checklist at the end of the chapter. It really is meant to be a hands-on guide to making those choices that will help you feel better about your town. So, you know, if you're living in a place where you're new or you may feel stuck or you're not sure you like it, these are ideas that hopefully if you do them will help you see the good in your town and feel better about it. So you guys, that is Melody Warnick. The book is called This Is Where You Belong. What Melody, before we go, I would like for you to tell everyone where they can get the book and where they can find you online to explore this topic further. Yeah, absolutely. So 
Um, my website is my name, melodywarnick.com. And if you go to that site, there are lots of links for different places you can buy the book. It's available most places where books are sold. And there's a paperback version coming out in July um, with a new subtitle. This is where you belong, finding home wherever you are. Um, and that, again, will be available online and in stores in early July. Awesome. July 4th, right? Yes. <laughs> Independence Day. Perfect. See? That's perfect. So yes, you can find her. She's on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and um, you should get the regular book or the Kindle, the paperback, whatever you need to do, because it's really interesting study how much goes into not only moving, but just the sociology really of how people are behaving in this manner. You know, from people like me to the millennials to, you know, just everybody. Melody, I'm really appreciating you for stopping by and joining um, because this is really, really detailed. Like I said, when I saw the book, I was like, yes, ah, you know, <laughs> it's like first the Bible and then this. So, <laughs> well, I hope it helps you to feel you know, feel more at home in your town. It's it's tough to be new in a town. And you mentioned been there 10 months and you're maybe not feeling it. That's totally normal, but give it time and, and work at it. You know, place attachment is something that we can create for ourselves. Like we can make ourselves feel better about it. So I hope it works for you. Yes. And I'm going to take your tips. I'm going to focus on doing things by foot sometimes and you know, getting involved, talking to neighbors, really, really good tips. If you guys missed anything, forgot what we said, get the show notes for this episode, which are at my website, dereeallen.com. Um, the link is also wherever you're listening to this podcast at. There's a link there. All right. Thank you for kicking it with me and I'll see you next time. Thank you. If you like this show, I'd love to have your support. Visit patreon.com forward slash kicking it with Dere without the G to learn more.